Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining this uh, BMA webinar in relation to an introduction to uh, regulatory uh, practice. My name is Clayton Williams. I'm a consultant solicitor uh, with BMA Law, and I'm very grateful for you attending today, and I hope uh, you'll find this of value. There, there is a option to ask questions during the webinar, uh, and there will be a period of time where I can um, answer those questions on your behalf. There have also been some uh, prior uh, questions that have been provided to the BMA, uh, and we'll happily answer those. But if you do have any further questions, uh, then don't hesitate to um, pop those onto the questions tab during the webinar. Uh, can I express my thanks, please, to uh, uh, Kate and Sophia and IT, uh, Chris, um, for their help in arranging the webinar today. So I hope you'll all be able to see the um, PowerPoint. Uh, the BMA Law is a has been set up as an organisation to assist BMA members with those uh, areas of law that don't necessarily uh, feature in member services. So if there are any particular areas of law uh, or concerns that you have, by all means, uh, feel free to contact the BMA uh, and they will happily uh, direct uh, those areas which uh, do not fall within member services to us at BMA Law. So, as I say, welcome to everybody. I hope you'll find some value to this. This is an introduction to the regulatory uh, proceedings and what you might expect if uh, you ever have contact with uh, the GMC or indeed the Medical Practitioners Tribunal. I hope it will be a, a practical session. But as I said, if you have any questions in relation to this, uh, please uh, come forward and uh, don't be shy. As I've mentioned uh, what the function of the BMA law is, and we are here to assist uh, members throughout the UK, uh, including uh, students all the way through your professional life, including retired members also. So just, to, just so that you're aware that safety net is available to you at all times. In terms of what I'm discussing today, which is, I hope, something that you uh, will never have experience of as a practitioner, um, my uh, role as a solicitor for, for some 25 years has been to assist members of uh, numerous trade unions in relation to primarily education uh, and health uh, issues. Uh, and I've been working with the BMA since 2016 uh, to provide regulatory advice and assistance uh, to its members. And as you can imagine, if any practitioner uh, hears from the GMC there, uh, first concern is um, fright generally and and concern but my role today is to uh, alleviate those concerns and any worries that you might have uh, and offer tips and suggestions to you so that any any process that you have with the GMC is dealt with in a uh, extremely uh, peaceful and um, measured way so I think the starting point really is to say that if you are ever contacted by the GMC, it's absolutely crucial that as a practitioner, whatever uh, type of practitioner you are, whether you're a, a consultant or whether you're um, just starting out in the profession or if you're a GP, it is absolutely critical that as soon as you hear, have any correspondence from the GMC, that you deal with it immediately, promptly, professionally, because the, the worst thing that can happen is that you simply put the letter to one side and, and bury one's head in the sand. Uh, the GMC, in my experience, are, are very receptive to a positive intervention. I know sometimes they have they can have a bad reputation, but I have to say, as a as a professional, uh, I've generally been very impressed by the way in which uh, they have uh, dealt with members. Of course, there are always exceptions. But in my experience, I find that the way to deal with GMC proceedings and indeed uh, medical practitioners tribunal proceedings is to be entirely open from the get go. So there is always that temptation uh, to ignore correspondence from the GMC. It, it is, of course, the worst thing that a practitioner can do, because should you do that, that in itself is potentially a regulatory offence for, for want of a, a better word. 
So in terms of uh, hearing from the GMC, my view is that as a practitioner, you should reach out to your professional organization straight away. So whether that be the BMA, whether that be one of your defense organizations, such as the Medical Defense Union, uh, or whether it be uh, other insurance-backed um, providers, it's absolutely critical that you inform your defense organization immediately that you've heard from the GMC and that you are uh, potentially being investigated by them. <clears throat> now, investigations by the GMC can span a, an enormous uh, range of different um, areas of, of law and practice. There could be health concerns that have been raised by your employer or by the practice you work at. For example, there are many doctors, sadly, who you know, go through bad periods of their of their lives, which can result in drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, there could be uh, issues where practitioners have been involved in domestic violence at home and other uh, criminal investigations. There could be wider health concerns about the uh, clinician, um, or it could be obviously clinical concerns that does uh, make up, as you can imagine, uh, a fair amount of the work that comes before the uh, GMC. Or it could be third party concerns where there is police involvement with a practitioner for a number of different matters. Um, or indeed the Care Quality Commission, uh, if you practice in, uh, have a GP practice in England, social services matters. So that the, the, the scope for GMC investigations is extremely wide. Uh, and um, obviously some matters are more serious than others. Uh, one point I just want to make about the GMC is that they do, they are able to um, investigate members who might have uh, ended up in some difficulty outside of the UK jurisdiction. So, for example, it tends to be younger doctors um, and medical students who might have been abroad uh, for a holiday and then they, they get caught up in a, uh, you know, a, a drunken altercation in a, in, a, in a street or a bar or they've ridden a, a scooter over the limits and they've got caught uh, and what often happens is that practitioners don't necessarily appreciate that offences that have taken place uh, particularly in the European Union um, they can end up on your uh, DBS enhanced check so just be aware of that that the the scope for the gmc isn't just on in matters in this country but also potentially abroad when you know you might have been on holiday so that's the first point really that you're absolutely open and transparent from the get-go that is extremely important it's one of the takeaways of today it, it's vital that you uh, respond to them accordingly um, and the flip side of that, of course, is that you have a duty as a practitioner to notify the GMC if you are in a particular situation. So a very good example of that is um, police investigations. You might have been caught drink driving or, you, as I say, you might, there might be a, a, an altercation that you've been involved with. It could, it could be more serious. Well, altercations are serious, but it could be... Um, something like financial fraud, it could be even you know, sexual offences. We have the whole range of, of uh, cases presented to us. Uh, and uh, if that is the case where you are the first person to be made aware of an investigation into you by the police, you have to obviously inform the GMC immediately. That there are some offences, for example, low level motoring offences, where we advise that um, it's not necessary to inform the GMC, but I would always check it out. So either check it out with us at the BMA or BMA Law, or check it out with your individual defence organisations. Absolutely critical uh, that you uh, maintain that uh, contact with the GMC at all times. So once the GMC investigation begins, you'll be asked to provide from the outset details of where you're working at that particular time. Lots of practitioners work in more than one places. Again, please don't ignore any material that comes to you from the GMC. Uh, answer their questions in full, send them back immediately, or, or get your defence organisation to do that on your behalf. Um, once that goes in, there will then be the investigation stage, which will result in what's known as a Rule 7 letter. That will set out 
what the uh, investigation uh, has thrown up uh, and whether or not you want to uh, comment at that stage. Again, that will be a decision that you will make with your defence organisation or your lawyers about whether you respond at that point or not. Now, quite often, if, for example, there are matters that have been put to you in the investigation stage where, frankly, full admissions at an early stage is the right and proper thing to do, that's what we would advise you to do, because the sooner uh, that you make admissions to any fault that you, you may have uh, committed, um, that puts you in a far stronger position later on uh, if the if the case goes to the medical practitioners tribunal now lawyers are often accused of being the prophet of doom and and you know this webinar is probably not what you really needed just before christmas to cheer everybody up with the holiday season but uh, it is important very important that people understand the decisions they make early on during the investigatory stage of the gmc process uh, can uh, have a marked um, uh, impact on what eventually happens to your fitness to practice license so it's absolutely critical that these decisions made early on uh, are made uh, carefully uh, and um, uh, promptly i have to say uh, because it, 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 these early stages are incredibly important and where there are admissions to be made um, that as i say that will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis the alternative view of course is that if the evidence uh, against an individual is pretty thin uh, if there isn't a great deal of evidence to substantiate the claim made by the GMC we will advise accordingly on that so it may not necessarily be the case that we um, engage with the GMC at that early stage sometimes if we feel uh, after giving advice that there isn't actually a case there for you to answer we will advise you accordingly and uh, retain our position until the GMC has made a decision on whether or not um, this case goes any further. Your lawyers and your representatives will know from their experience what sort of cases are likely to end up at the MPTS. So don't worry that this is going to be all on you as an individual practitioner, because it's not. It's actually going to be the role of your representatives to give you advice on what you should do and that is that's the reason why we're here to help you uh, with the process in terms of criminal cases quite often the gmc sensibly in my opinion they will await the outcome of the decision made um, by the police before they take any further action which i think is a very sensible approach because that can determine whether or not they take any further action uh, in the case. So that, that generally is what happens with police cases. It, employers, um, they don't have to wait for the outcome of a police investigation or a Crown prosecution decision, but quite often employers are happy to do the same, which again, I think is entirely uh, sensible uh, not to rush into any decisions if the police is still uh, in control of the case, if I can put it like that. Similarly, with clinical issues, if there is a, a clinical concerns about an individual practitioner, quite often we will await uh, for the uh, trust to um, complete its own investigation. It, we may want to see the findings of that first. There may be expert evidence that's required before we make any comment to the GMC. So all of these uh, cases are dealt with on an uh, individual basis. So no two cases are the same uh, and how you adv uh, will be advised will, will very much depend uh, on the facts of the case. Uh, clearly uh, in more serious matters the GMC will want to move very quickly because they'll want to potentially put the case to uh, an interim orders tribunal so if there are, for example, grave clinical concerns regarding a practitioner, the GMC, in line with its um, investigatory process, they will want to have uh, a hearing in front of the uh, interim modus tribunal because they, they may feel that actually in terms of an individual practitioner, 
they should have uh, conditions attached to the practice they might even be suspended from practice in the most serious of cases so just bear that in mind as well that's another uh, mechanism that the gmc do use frequently in the in the more serious cases if you have to appear before an interim orders tribunal it doesn't necessarily follow that you will be suspended from practice it might be that you'll have conditions uh, attached to your practice uh, and that you'll be able to continue to work so i think it's very important that you know, practitioners hear the words gmc or the letters gmc uh, and there's a an immediate um a concern which is understandable but actually you know lots and lots of cases in that come before the gmc they do not then appear before the mpts for example uh, lots of cases uh, are resolved by way of a warning uh, which appear uh, on your record for two years they appear on the public record for one and then they appear on the gmc record for two years in in total that that's often a um a good way to resolve the case and, and quite often members are, are content uh, to uh, finalize the case on that basis but but again in terms of warnings um, we can only advise members and practitioners to accept a warning if there is some admission uh, of fault so I think that the picture I'm trying to paint for you is that there are lots of avenues that the GMC takes this isn't just about the GMC contacting you and then it, the case will definitely go to the MPTS. It simply doesn't work like that. It really depends on the nature of the case, the severity of the case, uh, and there are lots of uh, other avenues where cases can be resolved and it doesn't necessarily result in a referral to the MPTS. If we go on to um, the, the broader concepts of what is expected of you as a practitioner particularly when cases are then referred to the medical practitioners tribunal what the um the gmc and the tribunal will expect is where members accept that their for example perhaps a, a clinical uh, processes weren't at the standard that is required as a doctor uh, perhaps you know people have gone through a particularly bad part of their lives and they that the wheels have come off a little bit and they they've got involved with drink or drugs perhaps there's been a, an altercation on a night out or you know something more serious than that what the gmc and what the tribunal certainly expect is for practitioners to be completely and utterly transparent with this process because ultimately the aim and the uh, overriding uh, protector for the gmc is patience so their ultimate concern is, of course, the safety of patients. That is the very essence of what the GMC, um, that is their modus operandi, to protect individual practitioners. But the GMC and the Medical Practitioners Tribunal understand that we are human. Uh, and ultimately, human beings will make mistakes. And it doesn't matter if you're a doctor or a lawyer uh, or a, 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 a chimney sweep whatever you are we are human beings and we all make mistakes so what they expect from us is to show an element of remorse uh, insight and remediation now it has to be genuine um, there's nothing worse than people ticking boxes to try and get through this process because you will be found out so it's a an interesting concept for lawyers because unlike litigation for example where you're trying to pick holes in in a case this is the reverse where you're asking practitioners to turn themselves inside out really and to consider the set of circumstances which has led to them being in front of the GMC uh, and that is absolutely critical uh, in ensuring uh, the best outcome for somebody's fit ability to continue in practice so remorse is part of that showing a genuine remorse for whatever it is that the gmc has uh, brought you before it for uh, as i say it has to be genuine uh, and it has to be heartfelt and uh, as i say it, it's very easy for people to make the mistake of you know paying lip service to this process is absolutely critical 
that the remorse is genuine and whatever the mistake might be they will expect then for you to show insight into your behavior whatever that might be so for example in clinical cases they will want to ensure again the safety of patients which will mean going on courses familiarizing yourself with conduct rules uh, ensuring that you understand what the uh, core concepts are in relation to being a doctor because doctors lawyers other professionals they are considered in a different light to the ordinary man or woman uh, on the street so we're not in ordinary jobs the clue is in the name if you like we are in professions which are regulated and they expect our conduct to be higher than the ordinary man or woman in the street and that doesn't just include our behavior at work it also includes our behavior outside of work in our social life and all of those aspects of our life can appear before the GMC and the Medical Practitioners Tribunal. So don't think for one moment this is only about clinical errors. It's not. It's about our whole conduct as a doctor. And every aspect of your life can be scrutinized by the GMC. So I think that's a, a really important message to send out I don't know whether uh, that's necessarily given enough weight in medical schools when when students are, are studying. Uh, it seems to me that more work could be done around this because the number of students or new doctors, uh, newly qualified doctors I've represented where they've got themselves involved in a, a silly uh, incident and they don't necessarily appreciate that actually those matters can, can uh, come before uh, the GMC and the Medical Practitioners Tribunal. But, but equally, this isn't about, as I say, this, this message today isn't about scaring anybody. This is about ensuring that you're equipped to get through this process in the best light possibly to ensure that, frankly, we protect your uh, profession and your careers. So in terms of post the, the, what we call the Rule 7, uh, which is the investigation that's been conducted into you by the GMC, we then have to decide on you know, what we do at that point. So we'll have the facts of the case uh, given to us, the allegations, if you like, and we have to decide on whether we prepare a statement. Um, uh, most times we will give a response at that stage. Uh, and the reason for that is that generally speaking most cases that come before the GMC there are some admissions to make so I, I put in this slide that there are pitfalls and the pitfalls are that uh, one of the risks um, of the process is that people don't make full admissions when perhaps they should this isn't uh, a lecture about you know always making admissions because that isn't the case you cannot make admissions to um, things that you haven't done that, that simply would not be right that that flies in the face of natural justice but where there are admissions to be made now is the time to make it because if you go into uh, an investigation with the GMC and you're not prepared to be completely open about uh, the position you're in uh, it's going to cause uh, problems later on. Um, so at this stage, if there are admissions to be made, if the evidence is clear, so for example, a good example of that are criminal cases, where criminal cases have come to an end, you might as a practitioner have a conviction for drink driving. Well, the reality is that if I was advising you at that stage, we would be making, of course, full admissions to that, uh, and we would uh, be entirely open and honest with the GMC because there's clearly a health issue in situations such as that. We have to um, persuade and, and clarify with the GMC that this might be a, a one-off, uh, a moment of madness, or if it's a more serious problem, you know, we have to be completely honest and open. If practitioners are having health issues, we have to demonstrate that you're you're dealing with those in a professional way you are getting help you are reaching out uh, and you're trying to get back on track and, and that is what they're interested in they're not there just to destroy people's 
<laughs> careers at all. They are there to protect the public. Uh, and so the statement point uh, is uh, important. It has to be carefully crafted. And that's why, again, you would reach out to one of your our, our cells or one of your defense organizations. That, that's absolutely uh, critical. One of the, um, one very important point here is uh, courses. So the GMC and the MPTS, they would expect practitioners to have undertaken courses. That might be, for example, in, in uh, if there are clinical concerns, they would expect the individual practitioner to improve and update their knowledge of any whatever particular area of medicine that you are engaged with. If it is uh, a more personal matter uh, that's related to your health or if it's related to a, a criminal case, they would expect you to show uh, that you understand you know, what your uh, responsibilities are in terms of your conduct uh, as a doctor. So th those sort of courses are, th there's lots and lots of courses out there available. Many of them can be done online. So it's not particularly onerous but it is all designed to satisfy the GMC and the tribunal if it gets to the tribunal stage <clears throat> that you've taken this matter extremely seriously and that you've gone outside uh, of your BMA or your medical uh, defense organization to show and demonstrate to the GMC and the MPTS that look you know I've taken this matter seriously I've taken those concerns seriously and I'm going to improve myself as a practitioner uh, and and that that is extremely important as is uh, witness evidence and support so uh, I have found in my experience that you know having a having support from a responsible officer uh, or a supervisor uh, or if you're in a GP practice, your fellow uh, GP partners, or if you're salaried, then whoever line manages you, they are extremely important. I mean, the evidence from friends, family, and co-workers, they, they, are, uh, they can be helpful, but um, they're not as significant as responsible officers and supervisors because you, one would expect friends and family to say good things about you. Whereas if a responsible officer, a supervisor, your line manager is prepared to um, put pen to paper and support you in this process, that will go an awful, awfully long way. So <clears throat> these are the things that we would expect to see at the tribunal when we're appearing in the tribunal on your behalf. We would expect admissions and remorse to some of the uh, allegations, not necessarily all. We have to be completely open and frank with the GMC and say, well, <clears throat> yes, we accept certain things, we do not accept others. There, there, there are uh, movements as well with the GMC case against the individuals. So for example, they may be satisfied that if you make admissions on certain allegations that the rest will, will fall away. So, you know, they, they, they are sensible in their approach, but uh, clearly that they want to ensure that the individual practitioner has accepted their wrongdoing uh, and that they're able to move forward in a in a constructive way in terms of outcomes so th this is quite a wide uh, area really so you can go from uh, no further action at all following a, an investigation by the gmc you might be offered a warning which is particularly used uh, frequently in health cases as i mentioned about the drink driving perhaps uh, being involved in low-level drug offending, um, that's often a way of resolving cases as long as the GMC is satisfied it's a one-off, uh, there's no uh, prospect of repetition uh, and that you know they are satisfied that patients are safe in your care. Then obviously uh, matters can go further than that, uh, the interim orders tribunal uh, might uh, place a, an interim sanction on you, whether that be by way of uh, conditions or by way uh, of something more uh, serious, like a suspension for a period of time, that that is uh, open to them at that point. That has to be reviewed every six months, but that can be dealt with in the in the most serious of cases. In terms of the tribunal, the sanctions then uh, generally are the same. Um, 
most frequently you, you look at conditions uh, and or um, supervision uh, and then of course the ultimate sanction for the medical practitioners tribunal <clears throat> is erasure which uh, thankfully is very rare uh, but it does happen uh, i mean they are uh, uh, erasure is reserved for the most serious um, cases uh, and the decision to erase a doctor is not taken lightly so i don't want you to go away from this webinar concerned about um, uh, this process uh, it's very important that you're aware of it but also it's very important that in terms of the statistics uh, thankfully very very few doctors are erased in any one year there is an appeals process so for example if you were to be sanctioned in some way you will be offered a, a, a an opportunity to appeal that is somewhat an appeal is somewhat difficult in this process because the whole point of uh, remediation is to show uh, insight into your behavior and the difficulty with an appeal often uh, with these cases is that one could argue that by appealing you're not necessarily showing um, sufficient insight so again you'll be advised very carefully on that having said that if um if it's felt by your lawyers or your defense organization actually the sanction is unfair then there is an, an appeals process that should be um exhausted if clearly there has been a an error uh, in terms of the regulatory framework and law around this so it's not to say that never appeal because sometimes appeals are appropriate if the sanction is rather too harsh but one has to be careful about appealing this because there are costs involved at appeal and those are matters again that can be discussed if you're ever in that position with your um, defense organization so just to reiterate really it's very important that you reach out to uh, either us or one of the other uh, trade unions or lawyers who support you uh, in your uh, role as practitioners it's very important that you also um, take up services around counseling uh, i find in my certainly in my experience that those those practitioners who have accepted uh, counseling during uh, this period uh, tend to come out of the at the other end in a much stronger position uh, I mean, you will know as medical practitioners the importance of counselling and support from independent people outside of the family. So I would always encourage, I always encourage uh, members and clients to, to to ensure that they are properly supported during what is a, a can be extremely onerous um, part of a practitioner's life because not only are you dealing with the GMC, you might on top of that be dealing with the police you might be dealing with social services depending on what the case is you, you could be dealing with a plethora of other organizations uh, so that that's why it's important that you ultimately protect your health as well um, and as I always say to people whilst you're in the eye of the storm it can be it can be unpleasant but uh, like everything in life uh, things come to an end uh, and it will eventually be in the rearview mirror um, so the 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 best advice I can give you really is that if you're ever if you ever find yourself in a situation where you uh, need to refer yourself to the GMC or if the GMC contact you, don't put anything off. Uh, reach out straight away. Um, get prepared. Uh, move very quickly. That's extremely important because the early stages of the investigation are, are critical, really getting off onto a good footing with the GMC, uh, opening up a, a good rapport and relationship with them, doing everything that you need to do to put you in the strongest position possible. Uh, and uh, obviously you won't be on your own because there are there's a whole uh, huge support network out there uh, to assist you with the process. So that was a, a whistle-stop tour of uh, what you can expect in terms of the GMC, in terms of the MPTS, if your case gets that far. Now, I've left some time because I know that there will be questions. So um, let me just go into 
enter the questions now and I'll, I'll get through as many of these as I possibly can. Yes, somebody's mentioned about employment tribunal process. Well, uh, I mean, there was a time uh, where um, often the employer would await the outcome uh, of any decision from um, the police, etc., before they, they launched any uh, employment uh, process. It doesn't necessarily have to be a criminal matter, of course, it can be clinical as well. I have to say, in my experience, trusts generally uh, will begin their processes um, prior to the GMC um, procedures ending. So, in other words, if 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 there's something workplace related, or indeed if it's uh, something that's happened outside of work, my experience now is that the employer will move. So, quite often, um, those representing you in the employment side of your case you know they will look at what's best for you as an individual quite often that will result in uh, questions to the employer liaison with the employer which can often result in there being an agreement for somebody to leave employment rather than go through a disciplinary other members will say well no actually this is not right i am i am i'm not uh, going to accept that and and they will go through the disciplinary procedure but that can all take place in advance of the GMC. And just on that point, it's a very good point because what happens with your employer, of course, can be shared with the GMC. So just to make you aware of that, that anything you might say in the disciplinary processes, and as is the same with a police interview, for example, all of that material can be shared. So it's incredibly important that, you know, when you're giving an account to your employer or to the police, that clearly the accounts should marry up because the GMC will obviously look to see if there's any contradiction in your evidence. You've mentioned here about whistleblowing and victimization about uh, raising concerns about patient safety. Well, it's a very, very good point because, um, uh, yeah, I, I have to say that um, in our experience, uh, you know, whistleblowing can result in a very difficult position for the member uh, and that's why it's absolutely critical to get lawyers involved because whistleblowing is a is dealt with in a different way to other areas of employment law uh, and um, for example you know there isn't the same requirement to have um, continuous service um, uh, with an employer in order to uh, bring a tribunal claim if you feel you've been victimized um, for whistleblowing genuine concerns. So that is absolutely a, a very good point and you must ensure that, um, uh, you know, absolutely that you must uh, be covered in relation to that. Somebody's asking here about medical legal advice if the issue arises overseas. Um, <clears throat> I think the answer to that would be really if the individual member was now working in the UK and if that would have any impact on their regulatory position within this jurisdiction. We can't act for a member if, for example, the example here is Canada or New Zealand. So if the Canadian or New Zealand regulator was investigating you for uh, matters in those countries we wouldn't normally get involved with that but if the practitioner is in this country by all means reach out to us uh, and we can clearly give it, uh, some initial advice uh, and help uh, somebody's asked here about a gp partner um, when they need to raise an issue about an employed doctor uh, i think that you, if there are concerns within a GP practice, if there are regulatory concerns about a GP practice, then there, there's always a duty to inform uh, the uh, GMC. There, there is, as you know, uh, duties on individuals to report. That doesn't always happen. So I, I, but the best advice I can give you in that situation is to ensure that the partnership is covered. And if there are regulatory concerns which the individual employed doctor is not prepared to inform the GMC about, then you are you are obliged to inform the GMC. 
uh, somebody's referred to the issues surrounding Palestine. Um, and the concerns about anti-Semitism. I mean, I think if if there is a if there is a feeling uh, at all at any time that uh, the regulator is um, you know is treating anybody differently, regardless of their our beliefs then obviously that is a concern and that needs to be raised and you're very welcome uh, if you're listening to contact the BMA who can then I can happily provide you with some advice in relation to that. Yes somebody has mentioned here about the BMA uh, representing doctors in the regulatory investigations. No that, that you are right that the, the BMA per se do not provide um, that cover for under member uh, services, but I provide that cover uh, within BMA law, which is a non-profit organization. So we uh, we do our very best to keep uh, fees as low as we possibly can. Uh, and we we discuss with the member uh, about, you know, have they exhausted all the other avenues in terms of their defense organizations, but you're very welcome to reach out to us and, and, and help uh, help you on that point. Somebody's asked about what happens if there's a report to the police which is clearly false. Please take no further action. In this case, the doctor was only made aware of this after the police concluded that there was no further action. <laughs> if the police decide not to take any further action in a case, then it doesn't preclude the GMC from its own investigation. But of course, why I like the fact that the GMC do not do anything until the police investigation is over uh, is the fact that they will attach sufficient weight to there being no further action in your case. It's a really sensible approach, actually. And, and this is what happened years ago, where employers would generally wait for the end of the police case. But that's probably been a different story in the last 10 years where employers now will uh, proceed with a disciplinary rather than wait for the police uh, the police to end their case which I think is a personally I think is a mistake so the GMC have got this right I have to say yeah it, somebody's made the same point about the BMA um, th this is why the service was set up in BMA law to help members uh, if they um, ever need regulatory help uh, and what you will find if you are members of, uh, of other defence organisations that it's worth checking the membership because quite often they will assist in clinical related uh, matters. They won't necessarily support the member if, for example, it's something outside of work. So each professional organisation will have their own rules around that point. So worth, worth checking out. Somebody's asked about the GMC, uh, you know, when you should notify the GMC about a police investigation. It's a very good question, that actually, because I get this a lot about, you know, should you report straight away or should you wait until there's a charge uh, or caution or conviction? My, my view about this is that I think you should report immediately because you should inform the employer. <clears throat> the reason for that is that if you are then subsequently charged for an offence, um, then it just looks better for you as an individual practitioner to show um, that you're utterly transparent from, from the outset. Uh, again, there, there are certain uh, offences around low-level driving matters that you wouldn't need to inform them about, but it's always best just to reach out and check uh, what is uh, required. Uh, somebody's asked about the GMC storing any concerns uh, against a doctor on a file uh, and then use it if serious concerns are raised again. Uh, not in my experience, I have to say. I've not known a GMC investigation where there's a fresh complaint and then uh, they have um, you know, had matters on file. Uh, that, they, that, that shouldn't be, if it is happening, it shouldn't be happening because 
if there are allegations that have been made directly to the GMC, the GMC should be notifying the individual practitioner about that immediately. In term, somebody's asked here about local investigations. Um, I, I mean, the, quite often the, the two will work side by side. So, and that that's a, you know something that's fascinating about health. You've got so many layers uh, of um, operations within health that you can have. You know, you can have local investigations uh, in addition to um, CQC investigations, but. The only organisation that can um, can comment on your fitness to practice, uh, which would result in sanctions on your practice, is the GMC. They they are the um, they're the uh, really they are the final decision maker in terms of your uh, license to practice. Yeah, thank you. Somebody's mentioned here about the doctor support service, which offers doctors emotional uh, support for emotional uh, and uh, other uh, matters. And uh, this is a free service uh, and it's available from the BMA website under well-being. Um, so thank you very much for that point. That's very helpful indeed. Yeah, somebody makes a point about uh, Sir Anthony uh, Hooper's report. Uh, why uh, the invest? Why the recommendations uh, haven't been followed? Um, I can check on that if you if you'd like me to. I can see your name on here, so if you'd like to contact me separately, I can find make those inquiries for you. Somebody's mentioned about time limits about um, patients and um, to raise concerns about a doctor. Uh, not particularly, there's not really um, any uh, time limit per se. There is a, there is a limit of five years um, as a, uh, as a uh, benchmark, but there are exceptions to that rule. But I have to say that if somebody doesn't raise the concerns within that period of time, uh, anything after that is going to be subject to a legal argument that within its own rules, there's five years, but there are exceptions whereby the GMC can reopen cases that are that are older than that. But that, as I say, is subject then to a legal argument. Um, yeah, I think that there's a question there about scapegoating innocent practitioners to cover up trust management fraud. I'm very happy for that questioner to contact me and we can discuss that uh, in more detail. We're very interested to hear your views on that. And somebody's asked then about uh, postgraduate deanery to restore an F1 doctor's employment after GMC, um, that there's a number of doctors who seem to be having difficulty in restoring uh, that employment. Uh, again, if you want to reach out to me, we do have an education department who can uh, assist you with that. I am familiar with uh, some of the issues around uh, that uh, following a GMC process, so I can certainly put you in contact with somebody who can uh, feel free to reach out to me about that point. Interesting point here about uh, doctors facing fitness to practice proceedings as a result of climate activism. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I think that you know clearly we have a right, uh, <laughs> despite um, despite what's going on politically uh, and despite this government's best efforts to um, uh, restrict uh, protests, we still have the right to protest in this country. And I think as long as you are doing so within the law, then uh, that shouldn't really be a matter for uh, a regulator. I can see that there's concerns uh, justifiably being raised about the GMC that um, you know the processes are often um, 
kicked into the long grass, not within the control of the practitioner. I mean, I'm not saying not a mouthpiece for the GMC, and I am I am aware you know, that there are things that, that have been reported to the GMC that haven't been dealt with, which so they're they're, they're certainly not um, uh, they're not without criticism. Um, uh, you know, I I agree that that there are genuine concerns uh, sometimes about the operation of the GMC, but in my own experience. I think if you've got somebody um, onto them all the time, they, I find them overall res responsive. Somebody mentions here about um, you know uh, practitioners who aren't on performer lists and not necessarily subject to regulatory bodies. I've come across that, and you're right, that can be a concern, and, and monitoring their behaviour can really only be done by the uh, em employer, frankly. I think in terms of, uh, it, you know, there's reference here to whistleblowing and covering up. Uh, yeah, there's there's no doubt that, that there are these issues that I, I'm hearing more and more about within the NHS. Uh, and um, uh, frankly, you know, police forces around the country uh, are becoming um, the the arbiters really of of this type of behaviour. Sadly, because because there is sufficient concern in trust that you know perhaps things aren't being done in the way they should be, uh, and that's why quite often, for example, coroners' courts will will recommend that the practitioner who appears before the coroner's inquest um, goes to the police. That that's really that is happening. Um, as shocking as that sounds. Somebody's asked about the remorse point that, um, you know, if you haven't done any, anything wrong uh, about showing remorse, I, I agree with you. I think it's very important to understand that uh, as a lawyer, you know, it, it's absolutely right that you do not admit to things that you haven't done. That's absolutely clear. Uh, but where there are acknowledgements and admissions, the, the time to do it is immediately. Yeah, it seems to be a familiar theme about you know concerns around whistleblowing uh, and about um, the issues of that where whistleblowers are bullied. I, I have to agree with you. I've I've seen this in cases, and that's why it seems that getting third parties involved in the, the, these most serious cases is is clearly a way forward in conjunction with in conjunction with the Majesty's um, coroners. Uh, okay. Somebody has mentioned that the the <clears throat> they had some difficulties in hearing the webinar. I'll I'll make sure that um, uh, this has been put uh, online for you to so that you can see it again if if there's been some transmission issues. Somebody's mentioned here about um, allegations, post-clinical concerns, subjective allegations. It's a really good point, actually, because if um, uh, you know allegations can be made, but they could be subject to expert evidence, and it is in, it is really important that um, the full facts are known before any comment is made to the GMC because you might have a patient or a family of uh, from the patient who make a complaint about the clinical um, treatment uh, and then you know we obtain our own expert evidence to say well actually you know the the uh, behavior of the practitioner was reasonable so that that's why it can in clinical cases take some time uh, to uh, respond fully to the GMC because we, we won't at that um, point have uh, sufficient evidence. Somebody's asking about BMA law and the medical defence organisation. I mean, the um, you know the, the practitioners are, are, are members of many different organisations, and uh, each organisation uh, offers members different uh, arrangements. So it's it's certainly worth 
uh, checking. I, it's a little bit like the indemnity point. I do I do a talk on indemnity as well, and it is so important that people um, go away and check you know, what their indemnity is. Uh, and I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, and if you want to have a chat with me about it, please do, do uh, reach out to me. Yeah, somebody just makes a good point about appraisal portfolios. Yeah, absolutely, they can be taken into consideration in relation to GMC investigations. And of course, you know, if you have uh, a litany of excellent appraisals over the years, then clearly, along with statements from a responsible officer uh, or um, uh, etc., then um, you know, all of that evidence will go before uh, the GMC. Somebody's asked about contacting GMC who believe you've been victimized by the employer responsible officer for raising concerns for sort of loan. Yeah, I, I absolutely um, would encourage you to do that if you have any concerns, but equally reach out to us or, or a defense organization uh, to, to chat that through first. Somebody's being asked to, as a witness um, regarding a consultant undergoing a GMC investigation. Um, yeah you can by all means contact us about that and we'll happily um if you want to reach out to me um uh, at c.williams at bmalaw.co.uk so that's c.williams at bmalaw.co.uk time frames within the the gmc to investigate um, well, it, it depends really on the, the size and shape of the case, uh, but um, they do have a prescribed procedure. But just to let you know that uh, their, their sort of catch-all position, if you like, is it, it very much depends. If it's a large clinical case where the coroner's involved or the police are involved, you know, it's obviously going to take a lot longer than, for example, somebody who's been charged with drink driving. So. Um, but again, I think it, it did assist that during the pandemic, the tribunal continued um, via teams, which meant that unlike the courts, they don't have the backlog, which has been really helpful to practitioners because things do get uh, moving quite uh, quickly. Yeah, somebody makes a good point here about press uh, involvement and, um, uh, anonymity. Uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, in terms of GMC processes, rather like our our courts in this, in certainly in England and Wales, uh, there is a, a fundamental right um, as freedom of the press. So uh, there are particular circumstances where you can argue a press restriction, uh, but the, the the basic tenet is that you can report. I'm afraid. I mean, I agree with you. I don't think it's always appropriate. Uh, yeah, I, I'm somebody saying about insight, and um, I, th I think just to make my position clear that uh, you know, one always has to say to individual practitioners that you know if these allegations are disputed, then we dispute them. It's not to say for one moment that we make admissions to things you haven't done, that's absolutely critical. Uh, but, you know, where where somebody has, um, where somebody has, you know, made a, a, a poor judgment, then, then it's important that we we say that um, immediately. It's a, very, it's a very different process to a, a court or a litigation that they expect, uh, uh, you know, it's not like uh, a situation where you're being prosecuted and you're defending something you're in essence being invited to make the admissions, which I agree that uh, for, from my uh, point of view as a lawyer, it's a very odd process, unusual process, but uh, it's not, it's very, very different to litigation. Somebody's asked here about uh, where somebody's had a much lighter sanction than you. Um, should you query this with the MPTS? It could be a, a potentially an appeal point uh, if um, if the sanction is so uh, markedly different. We we would be happy to look at that because that could be a very 
that could be a, a point of law. So you might want to get in contact with us about that. Somebody's mentioned about making full admissions at an early stage. I, I think, again, it, it sounds like a bit of a lawyer's cop out, but it depends on a case by case basis. Um, uh, and I think it, it, it really, really does depend on the case. But I think that there are there are cases where early stage admission should be made because it does help the practitioner later on. In cases where the evidence hasn't been properly collated by the GMC or there is insufficient evidence, then we would advise that you wait until the GMC have presented its case. Somebody's made a good, asked a good question about tips uh, to come across the MPTS. I'm conscious it's two o'clock. I'm happy to carry on. Um, I appreciate people have got busy lives, so don't, you know, if you've got to get back to work, I understand, but I'll, I'll continue with answering the questions if that's okay. And then if I understand if people have got to go, that's fine. But I think, Chris, I'm okay to carry on. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the MPTS, uh, one of the, one of the uh, options you'll have is to appear, either appear before them in person. The tribunal is in Manchester now. It used to be in London. Um, or you can do it via video link. My our uh, advice is generally to appear because people tend to come across much better when you know they're in the room, frankly. So, but there may be circumstances why you can't attend in person. But we, we as a, as a rule of thumb, we ask people to attend. Um, and as part of the process prior to the tribunal, we will we will give advice as to as to how to deal with. Um, the questioning by on behalf of the GMC, which will be by a barrister, uh, and then we have a tie-in at BMA Law with a barrister's chambers in Manchester, uh, and uh, obviously we offer uh, fixed rates uh, to ensure that members are given the best um, possible experience, frankly. Uh, somebody talks about sanctions the GMC has taken in cases of racial discrimination against colleagues over a long period of time. Um, I mean, quite often we will have cases where the racial element is part of a case. And so clearly, uh, similarly to the criminal courts, you know, those that are racially aggravated or uh, where there's an element of sexual harassment or where other protected characteristics are are brought into question, then the sanction re generally reflects that. Somebody's asked, hypothetically, if there has been a threat to one's life which the police are investigating, uh, would that need to be? No, I don't. If you're the victim, so if you're the person whose life has been threatened, goodness, that's terrible then that would not be a GMC matter you're you're in effect the you're in effect the prosecution witness so you wouldn't need to inform uh, the GMC about that unless of course it's the threat has been made by a fellow practitioner in which case that person should be reported there's a question here about NHS England performance list inquiry feel free to contact me about that so we can discuss it yeah again the climate protest point um, I think if you're acting within the law then there's no reason why that should be featured for uh, that should not be in the concern of the GMC Somebody's asked about, the, does the GMC wait the trust process to conclude? Um, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. Uh, but often, it's more often than not that they will. So again, it's a little bit like the police example. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's better really to, for the GMC to wait the trust process. But quite often, you know, the BMA or again, one of your defense organizations, they will, They'll conclude the trust process, uh, and you know that will hopefully be done and dusted before it gets to the GMC. Just to be a, just on that point as well, if, for example, you agree a settlement and you leave your employment, it doesn't it doesn't preclude 
it doesn't preclude the employer referring you to the GMC. You need to be aware of that. So, for example, if you enter into a non-disclosure agreement, you can't sign away the employer's right to refer the case to the GMC or the police. So I'm afraid it's not necessarily the end of the road, even if you even if you leave the trust. Yeah, it's a very good point. There's a point that's been made to me before about doctors committing suicide during these uh, processes. And it does happen, I'm just so sorry to say. Yeah, and that's why uh, the support is necessary from, from your defence organisations and, and through uh, any service that, that can provide support as well as family and friends. But it, it's, it's, a, it's not a, a, a process that is without stress. There's a question here about GP trainees who are going through GMC issues. Yeah, of course, deaneries have the right to refer to um, fitness to practice uh, as well. So I'd advise trainees, uh, it's a very good point about trainees because uh, it, check your indemnity, check your membership of defence organisations and feel free to contact us as well um, at, uh, at the BMA. Somebody's asked about um, GMC scrutiny and is the GMC good medical practice fit for purpose? I suppose like any conduct rules, it's the same in the legal profession that um, they are uh, guidelines really. Uh, they don't, they're not specific enough. Uh, it's quite interesting that when I first came into practice, as a solicitor, we had a, an enormous code of conduct uh, book, a great big thick volume, uh, and um, that's all been stripped away. And I, I think it's exactly the same in medicine, uh, where you know you you it, it's a catch-all. What's what lawyers would call catch-all. So I, I tend to agree with you that um, uh, the uh, conduct is, um, is is subjective and. Um, uh, one has to be careful uh, to rely uh, on conduct rules because they don't necessarily uh, aren't necessarily that specific. But the general principles uh, are, are really what uh, you need to adhere to. Retired from clinical practice about maintaining. I didn't get the rest of that question. I'm sorry. So if you want to reach out to me about that, that was a question from a retired, somebody retired. Uh, they're talking here about associates as well, maybe less responsibility. I, I've, I've often had questions from more junior doctors and, um, you know, clearly in, in many clinical situations, it does tend to be the, the consultant in charge who is looked at more closely for, for obvious reasons. So that there is, there is, there is certainly um, some truth in what you say that it will be, it, it can be top down in clinical situations because ultimately whoever the consultant is who is in charge will be uh, the one who uh, will have the most attention and the same for the coroner's court as well. <clears throat> I've been asked about a family breakdown allegations from an ex-spouse, involvement of social services and the family court. Very interesting question because I see this a lot. So for example, you might have you know, a, a couple who, who split up and there may be allegations from the spouse, the ex-spouse, there may be involvement with social services to do with the children uh, and there could be the police involved and it's all very messy and, and just horrendous. But um, what I always say to, to members about that is, look, just deal with one thing at a time. Uh, and, it, you know, it's a little bit like a tick box, really. I know that, that sounds a bit uh, emotionally um, 
it's beige, but that, that's the only way you can deal with these matters really. And uh, yeah, it can be a long haul for people. And that's why it's, it's, it's much better that doctors can continue in practice, even with conditions attached, because at least it's taking their mind off all of the other aspects of the case. But it, it, it is a situation that does resolve itself in time. So there's suspension. There's a question about suspension by an employee because of an accusation. Does the employee have the right to have the suspension continue until the matter is resolved? Uh, I think it's down to the employer on that point, actually. If they have concluded their investigation, if there's no further action, then you can go back to work. I, I would, in those circumstances, return to work because it's going to support your position with the GMC. But uh, clearly, the suspension can can end if obviously somebody is then dismissed or or if they leave uh, by way of settlement agreement agreed between the parties. Uh, yeah, there's a question about whistleblower, but potentially vexatious revenge on whistleblowers. Well, <clears throat> what we've seen is is getting these cases out to third parties really, so so, so that there's proper scrutiny rather than leaving it within the uh you know within the trust and that seems to be the better way of dealing with those cases uh somebody else about uh, where the gmc where there's no case against the doctor why would the bma take the case through an employment tribunal i think it, it just depends on the circumstances from the employer and what the employer's view was about the case but yeah of course um uh, the, uh, there's a whole range of options available to your advisors in terms of an employment case and um, that I would encourage you to, to certainly raise with um, member services through the BMA. Lots about whistleblowers, very interesting because it does seem that um, there are grave concerns about the way that whistleblowers are being dealt with and I understand that perfectly because I've been involved in a number of cases where it seems to me that um, it's not necessarily being dealt with at all in the appropriate way within in-house if you want to put it like that and that's why I have to say I admire uh, practitioners who put their head above the parapet really and, and whistleblown on unacceptable clinical behaviour but of course it does mean that um, it comes with its own problems, which it seems to me can only be resolved properly uh, you know, outside if the trust isn't dealing with it appropriately. The GMC consider paying for hair tests in addiction cases who can often wait up to a year. Uh, well, the GMC should be dealing with the referrals themselves on that um to, to check so you might want to reach out to me on that about and i can have a look at that for you yeah there's some questions that haven't entirely come out so if i haven't addressed them do reach out to me, c.williams at bmalaw.co.uk. Somebody's asked as well about the NMC and HCPC. Thank you for that question. I, uh, absolutely, that um, the principles are the same <clears throat> for any regulator, really. Speed is the, of the essence, openness is, is uh, of the absolute eff, uh, essence somebody's asked about um that they found i think you feel maybe the gmc is inconsistent in advice in relation to gp practices <laughs> Do you want to reach out to me on that one? I'm very happy to discuss that with you. Uh, 
I mean, there is. I, I know that there are concerns about the GMC. Somebody's made a uh, has made a point about the lack, perhaps, of diversity or cultural awareness. I am familiar uh, with those concerns, actually, um, and uh, where the GMC. I mean, there is case law on this, as you, I'm sure you're aware, where there are concerns about uh, certain uh, members of the GMC. But my understanding is that that case highlighted it, and that uh, one hopes that a change will will uh, be occurring uh, since that case. But by all means, keep us informed because we'll be very interested to hear uh, more information about that. This. Yes, it makes a good point about the timing of GMC um, letters and so on that are coming on a Friday or, you know, very late on in the week or just before Christmas. Um, again, uh, by all means, bring that to our attention because that, that's that's unacceptable. So, everybody, I think it's let's just check if there's anything else that people want to ask for. Somebody's asked for some advice, by all means, uh, c.williams at bmalaw.co.uk. Do feel free to reach out to me. Somebody refers to an MPTS tribunal where over a dishonesty matter concerning mileage claims. Uh, yeah, and you want to know how your defence union can help and reconsider, by all means reach out to me uh, if I can speak to you about that. The tribunal, somebody's asked about postponing a tribunal. Uh, you can certainly ask, yeah, I mean if, if for example uh, you haven't had sufficient time to prepare for the tribunal, uh, we have made adjournment requests in cases which have been um, uh, successful so um, absolutely we can do that somebody's asked about non-lawyers representing the doctor it's generally non-lawyers who represent the doctor at the uh, disciplinary processes they do sometimes trust do allow lawyers in sometimes but as a general rule of thumb it is uh, the BMA uh, representative who will be who will appear but in terms then of the, I mean, you don't have to have a lawyer at the MPTS, you can represent yourself, but it's generally uh, we would uh, instruct lawyers to deal with the hearings on your behalf and have a very good relationship with the barristers chambers in Manchester. Somebody's asked about BMA law, acting for doctors who have concerns about colleagues, uh, we can do. Uh, again, that's subject to conflict checks, but by all means reach out to me about that. There are charges, BMA charges members for certain um, matters that fall outside of um, the core services that, um, that the BMA provide, but again, by all means uh, do, do come back to me separately. Yes, yeah, somebody I mentioned about sort of cases outside of clinical and so on, uh, about fighting cases. I, um, I've not known cases where there's been, it's been part of an organised sport, for example, where opponents have been injured. I've not come across that. But um, I think it, you know, if it was something that was considered an assault rather than within the confines of the sport, then yes, it probably would be. Somebody mentions about a malicious complaint. Um, uh, clearly the GMC will investigate whatever it's put before it, but if there's evidence it's malicious or false, then it's unlikely you'd get anywhere in terms of being compensated by the GMC, but it's something that we could look at in terms of whether there's uh, there should be police involvement in the case. So by, by, by all means, uh, reach out to me if you want to discuss the particular circumstances of this. People are talking about um, time limits. Again, it's 
it depends on the circumstances of the case. I know that sounds a rather vague, lawyery response, but um, uh, there, there will be it, time limits will be to, to determinate on the circumstances of the case. Somebody's mentioned here about uh, mitigation circumstances and somebody's concerned that they should have been advised to have made admissions of dishonesty from the get-go, but their lawyer didn't advise this. So if you want to reach out to me, uh, we can have a chat about those particular circumstances. Historical um, GMC referral from a criminal record, would it have to be disclosed lifelong? I think that, you know, in the industry that we're all in, um, you generally will be um, asked to provide enhanced DBS checks, or they will, they will, you will be subject, I should say, to an enhanced G a DBS check. So any matters that appear on your record uh, will be known by your uh, employer. Ian Huntley case uh, changed the law around this, so you'll probably recall Ian Huntley was the sower murderer of those two little girls, uh, a horrendous case, um, and he had worked as a school caretaker and he had been arrested a number of times before the sewn case, uh, and it's because he'd fallen through the net uh, that's why we have uh, a beefed up enhanced uh, check. So it's that that arose from the um, investigation arising from these SOA murders. So that's why you know everything appears within the enhanced check. There's reference here to systemic racism and concerns about uh, that within it looks like an organization so do come back to me on that c.williams at bmalaw.co.uk there's reference here for an alleged concern is raised by another doctor who has acted out of malice or vexatious can you refer that? Uh, I think I'd need to know a little bit more if you want to come back to me on that. There's a reference here to delay in DBS certification. Uh, you can certainly write to DBS about that and ask them to investigate your concerns. Compensation for false allegations, very, very difficult, I'm afraid, against the police. Very difficult because they'll say that you know they're acting on allegations. You you can, of course, bring a claim against the person who makes the complaint. Uh, but you it, it's difficult territory because you have to, if it, for example, was a libel case, you would have to show that there was a loss. Uh, the law changed on this some years ago. So difficult, but very un grossly unfair where people make f false allegations. You can, of course, ask the police to investigate as to whether there's a administration of justice offence, whether they should be prosecuted for perverting the course of justice. Somebody's asked here that they had a one year warning. And they want to ask, they want to reinvestigate the whole case because of subsequent complaints. By all means, if you want to reach out to me, we can have a, a, a wider discussion about that because it sounds like it's quite um, intricate. Yeah, in terms of the GMT investigating deceased practitioners, uh, I, I'm not aware of, I, I, I don't believe that would be uh, would be a matter they would deal with because there's no risk, if there was a risk, there's no, ri no ongoing risk to patient care. 
you can be um, investigated even when you've stopped practicing because there may be a desire by the GMC to erase you. Um, you know, that, that does happen, I'm afraid. That is right. GMC can't send anybody to prison. Um, can they refer to the police? Uh, unlikely because they're not the complainant. So no to, to those. Do BMA need, law need to be involved in the access or will you consider taking on an appeal? Yeah, we can come in at any point. Um, it doesn't have to be we don't have to be in from the beginning. Somebody's asked about sanctions. Sanctions range from warning, uh, conditions on practice, uh, suspension uh, or erasure. Um, if you want some more guidance on that, please do contact me. Suing the GMC for uh, defamation. Uh, again, um, they will argue that they've investigated what's been presented to them. If they don't take any further action, it would be difficult to bring a claim because there would be a, a policy um, defence that they're obliged to, to investigate. But it's a good question as to, you know, at what point does the GMC uh, discontinue a case and whether there's any argument about whether a discontinuance should have, uh, should have taken place much sooner. I've, I have been involved in cases where there's been no evidence and the GMC should have made their decision much sooner. Okay, I think this is anything further. Yes, yeah, somebody's asked about the employer. Um, restrictions by the employer restrictions can of course include the employer can um, suspend you yeah so they can suspend you whilst an investigation is ongoing so I know that there's a number of people who said they'd like to contact me directly that's fine it's C. Williams at bmalaw.co.uk so feel free to reach out to me so yeah by all means uh, please do contact me there's a question about notifying the gmc well there's a duty on the individual practitioner but as an employer I'd, i would I would ensure that the individual has done so uh, if there is um, any concern. So thank you very much. I think that that's answered most questions, but by all means, I'm just flicking through and conscious is coming up to us too. If you want to speak to me about the rule seven or rule 12 procedures and the timescales in more details, uh, or anything else, then it's c.williams at bmalaw.co.uk. Um, somebody's asked about GMC MPTS procedures in private. Uh, not generally, no. There is the presumption uh, of a free press. But by all means, for specific concerns around MPTS and GMC, please do uh, reach out to me. Yes, yeah, somebody mentioned the five-year rule. The five-year rule is a presumption, but there are, are exceptions uh, where uh, you can um, you can go beyond the five years, but it's not particularly attractive and the GMC don't like to do it. There has to be good reason for doing so. Should doctors use a GMC number when making social posts? I probably wouldn't. Um, don't, can't see any regulatory issue if you did, but I would probably say not to do so if you don't need to share it. 
whistleblowers' rights, they're contained within employment law legislation. Um, again, if you want to reach out to member services or speak to me about it, I can direct you. Yeah, somebody said about the coroner directing practitioners to the police. This happens in inquests all the time. So where there's concerns about a trust or about the systemic failing of a trust, the coroner will often um, halt the inquest in favour of a police investigation. Uh, the problem with anonymous complaints to the GMC is that unless somebody is making a, a statement, it's very difficult for the GMC to investigate anonymous complaints unless they're extremely serious and then the police would be called in. Somebody's asked about GMC. Can you complain to GMC about the conduct of an em employer's investigation? I think that... Uh, Excuse me, it's not something that the GMC would get involved with. Your better course of action would be to raise a grievance with the uh, employer, uh, which would have to be investigated by somebody not uh, involved in the complaint, not referred to in the complaint. Somebody's asked about what happens if somebody's referred to a GMC, but they take no further action, what can you do to help the doctor back? Uh, by all means, reach out to me on that and I'll happily give you some separate advice. Climate protesting in uh, where there's law breaking, you could be subject to GMC um, uh, processes. Uh, somebody asked about a certificate for attendance at the webinar. I'll check that for you with them. Um, uh, with the BMA. I'm sure we can uh, arrange uh, that for you. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you for your time. Uh, I hope I've managed to answer most people's questions. If there's anything further that I can do to help, it's a huge subject, I know, and I, I know that the BMA are have asked me to run this again next year so uh, and also um, there will be uh, opportunity I think to have this sent or it will certainly be uploaded so if you um, if you want to uh, listen to it again if you want to contact me c.williams at bmalaw.co.uk uh, and thank you very much for your attendance today and I wish you a happy um, holiday season uh, that's upon us. So thanks for your time uh, and don't hesitate to contact the BMA, BMA Law uh, or uh, any of your defence organisations if you have any questions and please spread the word that uh, you know we are here uh, for uh, hopefully, um, uh, well one hopes that this will never uh, happen to any of you uh, but um, uh, if it does then at least you know that there is organizations out there that can help you uh, with this so thank you very much for your time and uh, have a great rest of the day take care thank you